We're looking once more this evening at the Song of Songs, page 726 in the Pew Bible. If you want to find it conveniently by page number, it's a little book in the Scripture tucked away between Ecclesiastes and the prophet Isaiah. I would like to take a moment to review where we are in the Song of Solomon since interpretation is so critical to the meaning of this book. I indicated last week there are so many views about this book that it is somewhat difficult for any person to stand up before a group and say, this is the way to interpret the Song of Solomon. I indicated that it evidently pleased the Holy Spirit to allow a variety of interpretations about this book to exist in the church for centuries, that he's not displeased with this variety or he would not have allowed it, And as a Christian who studies the scripture, I make it a rule of thumb to be firm in those areas in which the scriptures are firm and to be charitable on those areas where the scripture itself is charitable and allows a variety of viewpoint. Therefore, I would not in any way stand before you and tell you I have the last word on the Song of Songs, but I, uh, as one who by the Lord has been found worthy, to be a servant of his, simply share this book with you and look at it in a particular kind of fashion. One of the important things to assess as we even look at the Song of Songs is authorship, for authorship has a great deal to do with how we interpret it. And obviously last week I was espousing an interpretation of the Song of Songs which is rather hard on King Solomon. And it might have raised a question in your mind, well, if this book is as hard on King Solomon as you say that it is, how then could the book have been written by Solomon? And my own personal persuasion is, and again I share this freely, is that the book was not written by Solomon. It is a book which opens with the phrase, uh, the song of songs which is Solomon's, to to put the Hebrew literally, the song of songs which is Solomon's. And that can mean either the Song of Songs which is by Solomon or the Song of Songs which is about Solomon. And I have taken the latter point of view that it is a book which is about Solomon and very critical of him. A judgment on his lifestyle and on his moral profligacy. Nowhere in the Song of Solomons are we told that Solomon is the author, by the way. If we hold the view of interpretation of the Song of Songs that it is written by Solomon, then we would have to adopt a what is called the two-part drama view of Song of Songs, that Solomon became married to a northern girl, an Israeli girl from the north, that the Song of Songs is a celebration of sexuality within marriage, but it is not a celebration of fidelity, of loyalty, or of exclusiveness, since Solomon and his relationships lack all these things. If we take a three-part drama view, as we have done toward the Song of Songs, this, part, this viewpoint then allows a taking into account of later opinion toward Solomon. You see, Solomon's reign was a mixed bag. On the one hand, he was blessed in the youthful days of his kingdom by being great, given great wisdom. And when God gives a gift, as Paul says in Roman letter, it is uh, irrevocable. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So it's a gift of wisdom to Solomon that God never withdrew. On the other hand, as we read the scripture, we find great statements and hints of how displeased the Lord was with Solomon's reign. Even though Solomon is the person who was responsible for building the great religious institution of the temple, yet God found Solomon's heart deficient in his relationship with him, Solomon appears to have had the kind of administration where he was adept enough administratively to have kept down the prophetic word and go with the priestly function, that is, the ceremonies in the temple went on. But you read during Solomon's time and search for the prophets and you will not find them with rare exception. There is, however, one prophet that especially prophesies during Solomon's later years and his name is Ahijah, A-H-I-J-H. We come across him in 1 Kings chapter 11 when Solomon is nearing the end of his reign and Ahijah comes to a general in Solomon's army by the name of Jeroboam and says to Jeroboam the following, he is going to, when Solomon is gone, 
tear up the kingdom which Solomon has had. And the reason why this is going to be done to cite the prophet Ahijah, I, that is God, I, God, will do this because he, Solomon, has forsaken me and worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Moloch, the god of the Ammonites, and has not walked in my ways, nor done what is right in my eyes, nor kept my statutes and laws as David, Solomon's father, did. There is a final prophetic pronouncement on Solomon. I see the Song of Songs as a discreet prophetic protest to Solomon's lifestyle. That's the view I'm taking. I realize it's arguable, but I have the joy of having the pulpit this evening and no one's going to argue with me. The three-part view of the Song of Songs allows then for us to take this book as an indictment against lust, polygamy, and infidelity. It celebrates permanence of a relationship between a husband and wife. It celebrates a love that is exclusive in its relationship and does not involve other lovers. As the writer says of in the shepherd's words toward his bride, you are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. In those words, as we'll see tonight, he is celebrating the exclusiveness of their relationship and the fact that that relationship cannot be purchased. Well, last week we looked at Act 1, Love Tested, chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 3, verse 5. The first scene was in the harem. The northern girl had been brought there. She is soliloquizing, talking to herself about her love for her shepherd, longing for his love. The harem begins to praise Solomon. The Shulamite begins to reflect upon her own beauty and lack of self-esteem. On the one hand, she says, I'm dark burnt with the sun, not fair and beautiful like the others in the harem. But on the other hand, she is uh, satisfied with herself that she is lovely. The harem scorns her. And when Solomon approaches her, the first thing he does is compare her to one of his horses. Scene two involves a reverie at a banquet table. Chapter one, verse 12 through chapter two, verse 17. Solomon has invited the shepherd girl as his honored guest at dinner. But she continues throughout this dinner to contrast the moment she has spent in the countryside of the Lebanese foothills, northern Israel, in being outdoors on the green grass, perhaps in a picnic-like setting, under the cedars and the firs with her shepherd boyfriend, when they pledged their love to one another. And so that whole dreamlike sequence is a reverie, a kind of a dreamy, misty-eyed girl who is remembering the true loyalty she had with her shepherd boyfriend. She remembers the romantic day they had together. Then chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, takes us to the third scene of the first act of the drama, and that is a moment when the Shulamite girl, called Shulamite because she is from Shunem, which is a place in northern Israel, when she dreams that she has lost her shepherd friend, and she gets up to go find him. It is a dangerous situation for her and she does not know whether she will ever be successfully reunited with him or not. The plot intensifies tonight as we come to what we will call Act 2. And again, I caution you if you weren't here last Sunday night that the translation that we are using, the New International Version, has taken the liberty to put dramatic parts by the verses. So that you'll see in the NIV where it says lover or beloved or the like. I want again to remind you that that is the view of a translator. Those words are not found in the original text. They are a committee's opinion. And we're, as we go through the Song of Songs, are inserting uh, other parts because we are, in in effect, seeing the drama in a different way. This second act I am calling Love Strengthened. It involves an intensification of the conflict in the book. Solomon now makes a very direct approach to the Shulamite. The Shulamite, though, in this passage, remembers the words her shepherd has spoken to her in the days when they pledged their love to each other, and she remembers how she anticipated her wedding day and treats it as an experience which has already come. 
Even as Act 1 ended with a dream in which her lover had gone from her, Act 2 ends in a similar dream sequence, only that dream sequence is one that is even more frightening because in looking for her shepherd friend through the city in her dream, she is beaten by the night watchman. The first scene in Act 1 we will call Solomon's palanquin procession. Throw a new word at you. I like words. Don't you like new words? Have you ever seen that word palanquin, palanquin before? It is used in older translations of this text and it is found, for example, in verse 7. Look, it is Solomon's palanquin. We use the English word now, carriage. Palanquin, though, is a conveyance that consists of an enclosed litter borne on the shoulders of men by means of poles. Now, if you haven't traveled in a third world country that uses this kind of a conveyance, perhaps you'll need to envision for a moment uh, this conveyance of the palanquin. I remember as a child in the Orient uh, being born on a litter that was uh, strung between two mules, or was it horses, Dad? Either way, both. You take a couple of poles, you put some canvas in, in between the poles, and you strap it on the on the donkey in front and the donkey behind, and you can uh, travel for some time like this, and you can have sheltered uh, canopies as well. You have seen perhaps in pictures wealthy persons or princes or kings even born on, on the shoulders of men and, uh, and carried through streets, very elaborate sedan uh, um, conveyances. Um, and this is the situation with Solomon, in verses one or in verses six through eleven of chapter three, his palanquin, his sedan chair, is being carried into the city and into the proximity of where the shepherd girl is. And we are introduced to that scene. We, if we were imagining a stage situation, we would be looking off into the horizon and seeing the the uh, the, the dust of the air kicking up as the procession was coming our way. It would become clear as it neared us. And various onlookers are commenting on the procession which is arriving. One of them says, Who is this coming up from the desert like a column of smoke perfumed with myrrh and incense made from all the spices of the merchant? The first thing that attracted you as you looked at Solomon's palaquin in the distance was both its sight, it was a column of smoke, and its smell. It radiated the presence of aroma, it, uh, to the uh, Asiatic, of course, visual and arom aromatic impressions are important. It is as though one are saying, in the distance there is Solomon's Rolls Royce limo stirring up the dust as it comes out of the desert into Jerusalem. Look, the second speaker says, look, it is Solomon's carriage or palanquin escorted by 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel. Not only took four people to carry a palanquin, but Solomon was an important person. And the more people you had attending you, the more your importance was shown forth. Solomon has 60 people, 60 strong men in this procession, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side prepared for the terrors of the night. This is Solomon's secret service. Okay? A third onlooker says of the palanquin, which is nearing the harem, King Solomon made for himself the carriage, or that is, had it made or designed. He made it of wood from Lebanon. Of course, Lebanese wood was always the best kind of wood because it was in the mountains. It was cedar or fir, most likely here cedar. Its posts he made of silver, its base of gold. Its seat was upholstered with purple. Its interior lovingly inlaid by the daughters of Jerusalem. In other words, he had some custom work done on it. The final onlooker says at this moment, Come out, you daughters of Zion, and look at King Solomon wearing his crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. Of course, Solomon's mother was Bathsheba. Here the crown may refer to a laurel wreath. That is, every time Solomon got involved in another wedding, he had another laurel wreath to go with it. And uh, the women onlookers are simply at that point noting that uh, Solomon uh, has another wedding approaching or he is wearing uh, the remains of his initial wedding. So it's simply a kind of a calling our attention to the visual imagery of Solomon arriving on site. 
The second scene, which begins in chapter 4, verse 1, and extends through chapter 5, verse 1, we will, I will call two proposals and a response. The first proposal, if we may call it that, and I'm stretching a little bit perhaps here at words, but, but basically Solomon is indicating his interest in the Shulamite. The first proposal is from Solomon in verses 1 through 7, and the second proposal is from the shepherd in verses 8 through 15. And the response is given by the Shulamite girl in verse 16. And then the shepherd responds in 5.1. Let's look at Solomon's proposal. Solomon is caught up with the dynamic physical beauty of the Shulamite girl. Being the Hebrew that he is, he thinks of things in terms of their significance numerically so that he has seven beautiful characteristics of the girl that he has come to call upon. And here they are. First he notes, well, he first of all says, how beautiful you are, my darling, oh, how beautiful, and then he begins with a physical description. First of all, he looks at her eyes. Your eyes, he said, behind your veil are like doves. That is, they are bright, alert, soft, innocent, fetching. Your eyes behind your veil are like doves. The second characteristic which he notes is her hair. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. Now I challenge some of you guys to take a girl out and if you're enamored with her hairdo, you say to her, your hair reminds me of a flock of goats descending Mount Gilead. She's liable to take out a club and bong you good. <laughs> But for the Near Eastern mind, that was a compliment. There was no more beautiful a sight than to see a flock of black-wooled goats tiptoeing their way down a mountain incline or slope, and it set a certain kind of beauty as reflected against the skyline, the green mountain landscape, and it was a word of, a, of a beauty, a word of commendation. He next notes her teeth. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn, which means they're even. Or he did not see any buckeye teeth in the Shulamite. They are like a flock of sheep just shorn coming up from the washing. They're white. Each has its twin. Not one of them was alone. Now in days before Dennis, that's important. He's saying you have no gaps in your teeth. Each teeth, upper and lower, has its twin. They all match. And he sees her million-dollar smile. Her teeth have a gleam to them. And uh, that would have made, perhaps, if gleam toothpaste ever gets a hold of Solomon's line here, they will use it. Each tooth has its twin. Not one of them is alone. He next, in complimenting her, notes her lips. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon your mouth is lovely. He notes the delicate, beautiful red line of her lips. He notes next, as a fifth attribute of her, pers of her person, physically, her temples, which probably also included her cheeks. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Again, that may not seem like ador adoring language to our Western minds, but it is a beautiful physical characteristic of having red and healthy cheeks and temples. He then next describes her neck. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with elegance. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. <laughs> now this does not mean that she looked like a giraffe, simply because she had a neck like a tower. Solomon is reaching into his repertoire of Romance language and for something to be described as David's tower. In biblical language, a neck, for example, reflected character. A bent over neck reflected humiliation. You perhaps have seen this in pictures from the Near East where there has been a beheading or an execution. Frequently, especially in Muslim countries, a person will be made to kneel down and to bend the head. And someone may even put their foot on a person's head. A bent over neck is a sign of humiliation. The scriptures also talk about a stiff-necked person and that would be a symbol of stubbornness. The neck as referred to a Tower of David, the Tower of David was a military fortress and no doubt maybe the most prominent military fortress that was in the environs. 
That military fortress had on the outside of it shields of war, which stood for the fact that there had been past exploits in battle that had been won, and it was sort of the National Hall of Fame. It was maybe what we might describe as the as the Hall of Heroes, where the if you were a hero in battle and you you could get into the uh, the Museum of the Great, so to speak, your shield was hung on that tower. Symbolically, it represented something which, when you looked at, gave you a great sense of pride. It stood for the integrity of the nation. It stood for its strength. It was a, a very dear thing. And and as Solomon looked at the Shulamite's neck, he is saying that when someone looks at you, they gain a feeling of healthy respect and confidence. You portray to me what the Tower of David portrays to the nation, a sense of confidence, esteem, and uh, well-being. The final attribute of the Shulamite that he compliments are your two breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Here he is thinking of her in terms of playfulness and caress and noting that aspect of her person which is appealing to him. Solomon then is looking forward to their wedding day. He says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee. Remember, we looked at that particular phrase last time and we noted that this is a phrase which is spoken during the daytime. It is until the day breaks or until the day breathes, maybe an alternate uh, translation. The, uh, the Near Eastern day in the summer is a very hot day and there is a time at night when dust settles when the day, so to speak, breathes. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee. The late twilight hours are a time of elongated shadows. You stand out in the sun at noon and there's just very little room for your shadow. You stand out at 8 o'clock tonight and your shadow will be very, very long. And the shadows flee when the shadows all flee away is when there's darkness and there's no more shadow to be seen. So he is giving here a term of looking forward to the evening of their marriage and saying that until that evening, he will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. Some take this as a sexual reference here. I understand it to mean that Solomon is saying, until the night that we are married, I'm going to go soak myself in aromatic senses so that I am appealing to you. I will go out into the hill of myrrh, the mountain of myrrh and the hill of incense and uh, prepare myself so that, um, again, to the Near Eastern, so that I smell good. That shouldn't surprise us, by the way, as a fact, if you, if you look at the book of Esther, you see how important this kind of cosmetic process was to the Near Eastern mind. Esther is told in Esther chapter 2, verse uh, 12, before a girl's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for women six months with oil and myrrh and six months with perfumes and cosmetics. There was 12 months of saturation before coming to the king. So Solomon notes that prior to their wedding night, he is going to go to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of incense and then concludes with this overall compliment of her beauty, how beautiful you are, my darling, there is no flaw in you. She is to him Miss America, uh, Miss Universe, Miss World. She is um, a stunning woman in her physical characteristics. And if we understand that the words which follow are the words spoken by the shepherd, this means that basically all Solomon does in his pr proposal is rave about the physical looks of the Shunammite and doesn't note really other descriptions of her character that have to do with her inner being. He is simply stuck on her external beauty. And given Solomon's lifestyle, we therefore are not surprised that this would be the case. I wanted to throw in here, and it may not exactly fit, but this matter of of men simply being caught up with a woman's physical beauty and not uh, being aware also of the inner beauty of persons and how in our society we often uh, think awry because our thoughts are not centered rightly on this. There's a parable that I ran across by G. William Jones. It's called the Fat Stock Show. Fat Stock meaning a place where fat stock or fat cattle are judged. Two young men went to the state fair one day they were somewhat frustrated to find that the two major events of the day were scheduled simultaneously. Undaunted, they agreed to split up, one to each event, and then to give detailed account of the events to each other afterwards. That way, neither of them would miss much. Two hours later, they met at a hot dog stand to compare notes. How did your event begin? One of them asked. Well, the other said, the band played as a long line of very fine cattle were led into the arena for people to see. 
Each was a prime example of its species and had been washed and brushed until it fairly gleamed. Mine began the same way, but with a single difference. Then what happened? Well, each animal was paraded in front of a panel of judges who noted the texture of its hide, the condition of its eyes, teeth and gums, and its weight and proportions. My event was at the same except for one point. Go on. After the judges had looked at all the cattle, they put their heads together and chose the one which was the finest of its breed, and amidst large applause from the audience, they put a blue ribbon around the neck of the winner. Exactly what happened at my event. What happened to the winner? Oh, that was a very macabre thing. After being selected the finest of its breed, receiving thunderous accolades, being showered with prizes, after being led to the heights of glory, yes, it was led off to be destroyed by some of the very people who had been so enamored by its excellence of form. Alas, that's probably how my event ended too. That's strange. Did you go to the fact stock show also? No, I went to the beauty contest. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, it may take a while for that to sink in, but no, it's pretty good. It's, that, that, I was reminded of that parable that I'd read years ago as I read Solomon's attribute. He was at the fat stock show. Okay? Beauty contest. The shepherd now comes into the situation, and uh, this, these are his words to his Shunammite girl. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Descend from the crest of Amana, from the top of Sinir, the summit of Hermon, from the lion's dens and the mountain haunts of the leopards. It's very possible here that uh, what is being referred to is Solomon's harem in the north rather than in Jerusalem, and maybe that is where the shepherd girl is. And that the, uh, that the shepherd boy at this moment is thinking of his girl's captivity in the northern palace. She is in an inaccessible place that is the top of Lebanon and he chooses to name three of the highest peaks in the Lebanese mountain range. It's difficult to get to her and not only that, it's dangerous. It is the place where there are lions and mountain hots of leopards which describe the inaccessibility that he has in getting to his, uh, his Shunammite uh, girlfriend. And uh, so uh, he, is, he is commenting on that and he's urging her. And perhaps here it's just simply the girl again dreamily reminiscing. We may have an actual event or may have a reverie once more on the girl's part. But first he is urging her to escape from this situation. And he is sick with love in regard to her. You have stolen my heart or you have ravished my heart. My sister, my bride, you have stolen my heart. With one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace, how delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. Notice how he describes her not simply as a physical object, as Solomon does, but as already called her fraternally twice his sister. There is a camaraderie, a sense of family already there in their relationship. Come with me, or how delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine and the fragrance of your perfume than any spice. Your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like that of Lebanon, their favorite area. Milk and honey in the biblical mind, of course, was the sign of prosperity. You remember when the children of Israel were called to go into the promised land, they were told of the promised land in terms of it was a land flowing with milk and with honey. And the shepherd boy says of his girl at this point, Honey, you are to me the promised land. I don't need the promised land in effect if I have you. For what the promised land was meant to be to the people of God, you as a person are to me. And I think that, isn't that a wonderful compliment in terms of a relationship? All that Israel was meant to be to the people of God, you as a person. And then to talk about her fidelity and loyalty to him. The fact that she is exclusively his. You are a garden locked up. My sister, my bride, three times he has called her sister. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Let's comment on that for just a moment. Gardens and fountains in Palestine were surrounded by, or I should not say fountains, I should just simply say gardens and vineyards in Palestine 
were surrounded by rock walls to prevent the intrusion of strangers. Only the lawful possessor of the garden could enter it. Recently, we had a board staff retreat down at San Luis Rey Mission in about an hour and a half drive away from here. And one of the neat things about that mission was that they have a private garden that is enclosed and walled. And we found a, a, to w- a way to sneak into the garden and, uh, and just enjoy walking around in it. And uh, he is commenting about uh, his, his bride-to-be being a, a garden with a wall around it. That is, she is a private person. Theirs is an exclusive relationship. And not only is she a garden walled, but she is a spring sealed. In the biblical world, of course, water was scarce. The owners of fountains frequently sealed them with a clay which quickly hardened in the sun. And that was a mark of ownership and that clay seal was not to be broken by anyone else. That sealed fountain was designed to give water only to its rightful owner. Therefore, to him, to the shepherd, she is a person who is reserved exclusively for him. She has not been possessed by anyone else nor is she to be regarded as anyone else's possession. She, for the shepherd, is a garden paradise. And he notes that your plants, or the King James has shoots, or the idea is the expressions radiating out of your personality are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna and nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with every kind of incense tree, with myrrh and aloes and all the finest spices. Now, we won't comment on the significance of each of those terms, except to note that the shepherd regards his Shunammite girl as a garden paradise of delightful fruits, fragrant flowers, colorful blossoms, towering trees, and aromatic spices. Every branch of her personality is scintillating, flavorful, enchanting, aromatic. Not only that, she is not only an Eden, a garden of Eden to him, but she is cool, fresh water to him. You are a garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon, which would, of course, be cool because it's coming down from the mountains. And so he mixes his metaphors, having called her first a garden and then a fountain. He finally says, you're a, you're a fountain within the garden. That's what you are to me. The Shulamite then responds, to this invitation of love. And again, we are maybe dealing with a dream sequence. And she says to her shepherd boyfriend, Awake, north wind, and come south wind. Blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread abroad. Let my lover come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. She is at this point uncertain as to where her shepherd friend is. So she calls for the winds to blow and spread her fragrance to wherever he is, so that he might know where to find her. Come north wind, if he's to the south, the north wind would waft the aroma of her presence to him there. If he is in the north, the south wind would waft the aroma of her presence there. It's poetic metaphor. Blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread abroad. Let my lover come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. And she is not reticent at all about describing the delight that she looks forward to on their wedding night when fully their personalities will come together and they will celebrate the joy that God has placed in a marriage relationship. We uh, then see the lover responding and it is as though the girl sees in this moment her wedding as already having come. He responds to her, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. He then describes their wedded love as a beautiful garden he has enjoyed and as a great feast he has celebrated. And at that moment, a voice enters the scene. Eat, O friends, and drink. Drink your fill, O lovers. And question arises interpretively as to who speaks this. Where does this voice come from? I personally would hold to the somewhat dramatic view that it is at this point God speaking on their wedding night saying to them, Eat, O friends, and drink. Drink your fill, O lovers. They have regarded each other with proper chastity and reverence. And now, on their wedding evening, God is saying to them what He said first to Adam and Eve. It is not good that a man or a woman should be alone. I will make a helper for him 
and for her. God saw all that is made, and including the creation of man and woman as husband and wife, and sees it as very good. And I would see this voice now as God speaking in the situation and putting his stamp of approval upon their relationship, which is what we always seek in Christian marriage, isn't it? We believe that Christian marriage carries with it, with it the approval of God himself and that sexuality within marriage is God's idea and not man's at all and that it is the world that has perverted the whole concept of what God designed for sexual experience and so robbed it of its richness and its meaning that it has become profaned in the world. But God restores it to its rightful place and honors married relationship. Eat, O friends, and drink. Drink your fill, O lovers. In a day in which the concepts of fidelity and loyalty and purity are laughed at and scorned, here is God's word celebrating a couple who has maintained with one another and with him purity in thought and deed. Well, as the shepherd girl has had this dreamlike sequence of the wedding invitation from her shepherd and the wedding day which has been anticipated and indeed dreamed of as though it had already occurred. We then come to another scene in this second act, and that is a frightening dream. Chapter 5, verse 2 through chapter 6, verse 3. She is once more dreaming as she did in an earlier chapter when we closed last Sunday night session. We noticed her dream in chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. This time her dream sets is set in the context of after their marriage. She has been reunited with him, a thing that is now physically impossible because she is in Solomon's court. And she dreams. I sleep, I slept, but my heart was awake. Have you ever had that experience? You slept, but your heart was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. And of course, this would describe him if he indeed is the shepherd. He has been out with his flocks in the evening. The Palestinian dew is settled heavy upon the ground as it does in the springtime or in the fall time or even in the summertime in Palestine. And he has been out with the flock. Now he is asking for entrance to the room. She responds, I have taken off my robe and must I put it on again? I have washed my feet. Must I soil them again? My lover thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my lover and my hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my lover, but my lover had left. He was gone. My heart had gone out to him when he spoke. I looked for him but did not find him. I called him but he did not answer me. Here is a classic story that is repeated in so many marriages of a love that once in its romantic days glowed with ardor, but now has has come up against a moment of inconvenience. The shepherd, as far as the Shulamite was concerned, came to her now at an inconvenient moment. She had now prepared for bed. She had washed her feet to walk across the dirt floor again would be an inconvenience. He models a tremendous man characteristic of love in not insisting on his own way and that when she does not answer to his call, he leaves discreetly. Every married couple, I think, would do well to ponder the roles that are here the reticence of the wife, and as well the charming, discreet discretion of the husband. That there is on the one hand the sin of unwilling to be inconvenienced, and on the other hand there could have been the sin of loving and insisting on its own way. She dreams this sequence in which she has turned aside the one she loves. She rises now in the evening to search for him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my cloak, those watchmen of the walls. I think that here we have not only a terrible moment in a dream, and we've all had dreams, haven't we, where we have had dire things happen to us. 
you ever had a train coming on you and you try to run away and you cannot run fast enough to get off the trestle? That is one of the most frustrating things that you can ever go through. Or seeing a child playing in the street and a car is coming down at 75 miles an hour and it's your child and you race to get them, only you, every step is a huge effort and you can't make it. That's exactly the feeling she's having here in this dreamlike sequence. She cannot find him when she goes out looking and the watchmen beat her. Perhaps here too there is something deep and psychologically profound that is being stated that when there is the, uh, the creeping in of, uh, shall we say, uh, complacency in a marriage relationship that the immediate effect of that complacency is a wounding to the parties that are involved, a damaging, a hurting she turns now in her dream to the harem and says, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my lover, what will you tell him? Tell him I am faint with love. She says, if anybody locates him, tell him I am sick with love. They respond to her somewhat, I would think, uh, sarcastically. How is your beloved better than others, most beautiful of women? How is your beloved better than others that you charge us so? Well, she is not at all reluctant to answer that question about how her shepherd, now husband, is better than all others. And, and why is it her here? I hope you feel that way toward your husband, that uh, you think that he's better than anybody else. She describes him in this way. My lover is radiant and ruddy. Outstanding among 10,000. 10,000, of course, is a Hebrew idiom meaning uh, nobody's to compare. His head is purest gold. His hair is wavy and black as a raven. Notice he was not bald. I had to get that in. <laughs> His eyes are like doves by the water streams washed in milk mounted with jewels. Boy, she is really capable of poetic expression to describe uh, the iris of an eye that's set in a bed of white a gorgeous description. His cheeks are like beds of spice yielding perfume, no doubt talking of his beard. His lips are like lilies dripping with myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with chrysolite. His body is like polished ivory decorated with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as its cedars. Lebanon would be a reference to height. His mouth is sweetness itself. Here he's, she's talking about his speech. Whenever he speaks to her, he speaks in a way that upbuilds her. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover. This is my friend. Notice that in their relationship, he is not simply her lover. He is her friend. This is my lover. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. She responds when asked to describe her loved one by saying in the vernacular, he is tall, dark, and handsome. But he is all so much more than that. The way that he speaks to me. Boy, isn't it possible in a married relationship to speak lovingly in a public context and say quite another thing uh, that you would never be caught dead saying in the front of witnesses? And I will confess to that sin on occasion. That I, that, uh, that I would say things. That, uh, that I would be embarrassed if you ever heard because there's a safety in a relationship where sometimes you can feel confident enough in a relationship you, you say things that you wish you had eaten. Uh, but he, uh, she compliments him on, the, on his tremendous control. and What a model she puts for all other husbands here. Compliments him for the way he has consistently spoken to her and says of him, he is altogether lovely. And we use that phrase, don't we, even to refer to Christ when we want to describe him and sum him up in a phrase, we say he is altogether lovely. Well, the, um, the harem then says in a question, where has your lover gone, most beautiful of women? Which way did your lover turn that we may look for him with you? She really doesn't want their help. After all, it's only a dream. And immediately she lets us know in verses 2 and 3 that it had been a dream. For the dream, in the dream she lost him, but in verses 2 and 3 she knows where he is. She never lost him at all. It was only in the dream that she lost him. She says when she awakens, and she awakens within the dream. 
My lover has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to browse or to pasture his flock. It would be a better rendering. To pasture his flock in the gardens and to gather lilies. I know where he is. He's taking care of his responsibilities where he usually is. He is not lost wandering out there. I am my lover's and my lover is mine. He pastures his flock among the lilies. I know where I can find him. She closes her statement here in verses 2 and 3 by restating the exclusiveness of their relationship with each other. I am my lover's, no one else is. And he is mine and no one else is. Well, what are some applications that we can look at as we try to take some principles that are involved in the narrative? And I think it's important to look at the narrative first in order to derive the principles. Some applications. First, courtship and marriage. I think in comparing the proposals of Solomon and the shepherd, we would have to say that one is superior to the other in that one looks upon the heart and the personality whereas the other looks exclusively on the outward impression. Solomon had money, he had popularity, he had position, he had much to offer economically. But he really did not have to offer what was the most important, loyalty, fidelity, trust, a sense of the importance of the worth of another human being as isolated from simply their external pleasure and what she could do for him. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, in this regard, shares a tremendous poem of love. When she tells the story in her poem about the young couple that were in love, she wanted a life of wealth and ease, and he aspired to be an artist. On his very minimal wage as an artist, he could not provide the comfort financially that she wanted. She settled for a man, therefore, that was older than herself and wealthy. Years later, they meet. He is now, in his maturity, a famous, world-renowned artist, and she is wealthy. But she regrets what they have done. And she says, as Elizabeth Barrett Browning puts these words in her lips, she says this to what once had been her boyfriend, her artist. No one calls you a dunce and people suppose me clever. This could have happened but once and we missed it, lost it forever. I think that spirit that Elizabeth Barrett Browning reflects is seen and modeled in this song in the proposals. Only the girl here in Song of Songs did not miss it or lose it forever. She made the right kind of choices. And I would hope that the young people here in this uh, room who are one day contemplating marriage or maybe even soon would consider the fact that you are marrying a person. You are not just marrying someone with an outward visibility and that God calls for you in a relationship to be whole in that relationship, that much more is involved in marriage than simply physical attraction. That's important. It has its place. But marriage as a meeting of two people is so much more than that. The second application to courtship and marriage is this. To establish in our hearts that we are to be exclusively the possession alone of our life partner. That is celebrated in phrases like you are a garden walled, you are a spring sealed up, or in the phrase I am my beloved's and he is mine. Here we see the value that the Lord puts upon the exclusiveness of a relationship. Virginity in our culture has become a bad word. It has become a word which stands for a sort of reprehensible moral innocence and naivety. But it is not so in God's eyes. Words like virginity, loyalty, fidelity in the Lord's eyes are valued and esteemed and praised. And what is celebrated in this song is the establishment in the heart of the shepherd and the Shulamite that they have determined to be exclusively for one another. The third thing, which is in this as an application to courtship and marriage that I would share this evening, is for married people to shun the trauma within a marriage relationship which comes through indifference or selfishness 
And we saw that modeled in the dream sequence this evening, where on the one hand, she as the bride to her shepherd husband was indifferent. And on the other hand, he modeled an unselfishness rather than a selfishness to shun the trauma and the wounding that occurs within a relationship because of indifference on the one hand or selfishness on the other. What can be applied to our relationship with Christ? We have not treated this book as an allegory. That is, we have not sought to found and to find in every word and phrase some mystical meaning which celebrates Christ's relationship with his church. But simply because we have not taken an allegorical view does not, on the other hand, mean that there isn't legitimate spiritual application there. I think there is. I would draw these applications from their relationship, the shepherd and the Shulamite, to our relationship with Christ, portraying us now as the bride and Christ as the bridegroom, him as the shepherd and we as the Shulamite. The first application, and I would ask all of these in the form of questions. Do we know the rejoicing of the bridegroom over us? Do we know the rejoicing of the bridegroom over us? God has a love affair with his people. God so loved the world. God so loved you and me that Christ Jesus came into the world. He deeply loves us. And I'll tell you, I don't know yet of a wedding ceremony that I have performed as a minister where the bridegroom got to the altar, looked at the bride and said, isn't she ugly? Doesn't she have a lot of flaws? I married her out of pity. Nobody else would have her. Aren't I good? Look what I did for her. Do you think that Jesus looks at his bride that way? Do you think we as his bride, he comes before the Father and says, look at this bride I've got. Not very pretty, is she? Well, now we with our own feelings of worthlessness, of course, are, are, are feeling that way. Lord, we we're, we're really are worthless. Nobody else really would have us. We really are ugly, you know. But there's something tremendous that the Lord does for us in seeking out a relationship with us because he sees within our lives that which is lovely and which he can make lovely and graceful. And we as his bride are to, be, are to see ourselves as a delight in his eyes. I think a marriage relationship that is based upon one of the partners in the marriage feeling a sense always of their own ugliness and worthlessness is going to be a real drag in that relationship. The relationship is going to be so consumed with their own inability to see themselves as their bridegroom sees them. And I I don't uh, want to overly press this point and get theology that shouldn't be there, but just to simply say that Christ died for people whom he loved. Christ came for people whom in his eyes he regarded as beautiful and worth winning and worth bringing to his eternal palaces. He thinks enough of you and me that he wants us to live with him forever. And I think that's a pretty high view. The gospel of Jesus Christ has an extremely high view of mankind. It is the humanists that have the low view who regard man in the Hugh Hefner kind of a way that mankind is something that goes through your hands like a disposable towel and is worth only what can be milked out of the passing moment. The gospel of Jesus Christ looks at people in terms of their true worth and being and identity. Isaiah chapter 62 verse 5 says, As the bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will God rejoice over you. I want you to think of that. Would you like me to repeat that? I'm going to repeat that. I think that's so exciting. As the bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will God rejoice over you. Isaiah 62.5. That's marvelous. Next time you attend a wedding, see in that wedding, mirror the relationship the Lord as bridegroom has with you. Do you know his rejoicing over you? A second application that I would get, and of course, by the way, the shepherd has continued to rejoice over the Shulamite through this. The second application I would get by way of question is, do we honor the exclusiveness of our relationship with the Lord? Do we we see our first fundamental loyalty in life of being committed to him? Are we to him a garden walled, a spring sealed? Are we to him that delight of relationship which can say, I am my lover's and he is mine? Or is it possible that in our spiritual relationship we have become so enamored with other pursuits that our relationship really becomes 
adulterated so that the exclusiveness, the fidelity, the setting of the right priorities has been set aside because we are chasing, if you will, other gods. The exclusiveness of the relationship of the Shulamite and the shepherd is meant to model the exclusiveness of the relationship with Christ and his people. And we are called upon to honor the exclusiveness of that relationship and to see our own lives as the, as the garden in which the Lord delights to walk. The fruit of our lives being that which brings Him pleasure. The water from our life which He has placed within us by the Spirit, that which assuages His thirst for interpersonal relationship. Do we honor the exclusiveness of our relationship? A third question, and I think a really a neat question as well, is are we alive to the beauty of our Lord? The Shulamite is really alive to the beauty of her shepherd. When she celebrates her handsome shepherd in verses 10 through 16 of chapter 5, it's really a marvelous parallel to how John describes Jesus in the book of Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 18 where he runs through a set of characteristics of what his Lord is to him and he is unabashed in his declaration of loyalty and love for Jesus Christ. Speaking in poetic metaphor, even as does the shepherd uh, or the Shulamite here. She says of her shepherd, he is the fairest of 10,000. He is altogether lovely. And it is therefore fitting that when we describe our Lord, we may say of him those same kinds of things. Love, you see, allows liberty of language. I would not just walk up to anyone and say some private expression of love like you're the fairest of 10,000. I would simply say you look rather well today. (laughs) But the exclusiveness of relationship allows the developing of liberty within language. And it is all right to speak of Jesus as lover of our soul as beautiful Savior and wonderful Lord, as uh, the name above all names. He is altogether lovely. A fourth question to ask as an application. Are we ready to be inconvenienced for His sake? Are we ready to be inconvenienced for His sake? Have we settled down in the safety of a relationship uh, with the Lord has become commonplace. And he might be standing anew at our door and knocking for entrance. And perhaps at that moment in our life, it's inconvenient to respond to his call. It's inconvenient to follow him where he wants us to go because we have settled down. We have taken off our shoes, as you will, and we're unwilling to invest that extra amount of energy which would make it possible for us to Respond to the Lord's call. I pray that in my own life, and I pray this for you as well, that I won't come to a place in my Christian experience where Christ would be found knocking at the door of my life and I would simply say to Him, Lord, I hear what You're saying. I know that's important to You, but it's inconvenient now to respond. I'm doing other things. And would You please let me go about my way and if You'll go about Yours for a while and we'll meet again some later time. The development of the inner life of response to Christ where we can be sensitive so that when he says, I want you to go here, we'll go. When he puts within us some response that he wants, we'll say, here am I, Lord, at your disposal. Send me. And I pray that we'll be believers who will be so in love with our Lord that we can be inconvenienced at his call. Let's look to him now in prayer. Lord, again this evening we thank you for the beauty that is in your word as we share it tonight. For the model of her love relationship which points us to the model of our relationship with you. There are other voices in this world which attempt to point to our worth as human beings people with affirming philosophies and viewpoints which like Solomon to the bride attempt to get them to have a human assessment of themselves. But it is only in you that we find our true worth and significance. And unless we enter into that relationship with you which is the 
wholesome one you seek, then all of our other relationships somehow are bent and destroyed and are rusted. Lord, we pray for the healing of relationships here this evening with you which may be injured. The creation of a relationship with you where such a relationship may not exist. And we pray also, Lord, for the young people within our midst who are looking forward in their own life to a moment of marriage. I pray, Lord, that each of them would live by the values on human life that you have taught. We pray, Lord, that you will save them from the complex of this world, from the Madison Avenue hype which celebrates the things that are wrong and destroys the things that are right. And that for us as believers, purity and fidelity and loyalty would be, as you intended them to be, words to be treasured, experiences to be celebrated. That you would, in marriage relationships here as well, bring within Christian marriages in this day when the foundation of marriage is being shaken, that you would create within each marriage a safe place, indeed a walled garden, a spring to be used in an exclusive sense, a personal relationship that is resting, that is comforting, that is alive, with color and vitality and aroma, that we may be a sweet-smelling savor to you and to our world, that within the marriages represented in this church family, there will be such a wholeness and beauty that is attributable to your work of grace in our hearts. Pray for the healing of marriage relationships where there is hurt, where there has been selfishness or inconvenience, that you would minister to each person here. We, Lord, now take these moments to delight in your presence, to express our love for you once more as our altogether lovely one. We honor your name and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.